Hello, this is Pastor Gavin Whitcomb from Moore's Mountain Church. Are you ready to dig into God's Word? So am I. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness to us. We pray as we look into your word, you would guide us into your truth. Help us to understand it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, well, we're continuing our studies uh, verse by verse through the book of Ephesians. And uh, we find ourselves in Ephesians chapter 4, where the Apostle Paul is describing how Christians are to live. And so he brings out the point that uh, we're to live differently than the unbelieving and unregenerate world around us. So Paul's description of the way Christ teaches us to live focuses on how we're to relate to others in a God-honoring way and how we can, we can express God's love for one another. So this morning we're going to focus on verse 30, and it says this, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Okay, so, uh, you know, it's interesting that when he says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God, the fact that this command is placed in the middle of sinful ways of relating to one another, it implies that these very things would grieve the Holy Spirit of God. What kind of things? Well, being angry and sinning, giving place to the devil, stealing, letting corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, bit bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking and malice. These sorts of things would grieve the Holy Spirit of God. That's kind of the implication here. Now, before we explore what it means to grieve the Holy Spirit, I think it'd be helpful to be reminded of who he is and the Spirit's ministry within the believer. You know, I say who the Holy Spirit is, not what the Holy Spirit is. He is a who, not a what. He's a person. In fact, he is God, the Spirit. Now, the Bible is clear that there's only one God, okay? But there are three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit is God, but yet only one God. And and so, now, uh, the Bible's clear that there's only one God. Okay, Exodus 20, verses 1 through 3. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which hath brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Why? Well, because there's only one true and living God. James 2.19 says this, Thou believest that there is one God? Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Notice, um, one of the marks of being, uh, uh, being theologically correct is to believe that there is one God. And James says, you believe there's one God? Well, so do the demons, and they believe and they tremble. So the, the point is, just believing in God doesn't make you right with God. And uh, there are a lot of people, they have this idea, oh, I believe in God, so I'm okay. In other words, the, their idea is they believe in the existence of God, as though they're doing God some kind of big favor by just believing in his existence. Well, you believe that there's one God, thou do well, the devils also believe and tremble. So it takes a saving faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus said, you believe in God, believe also in me. Okay, now, so back to the point of there's one God, 1 Timothy 2, 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Now, there's one God and one mediator between God and man. Why is Jesus the mediator? Well, because he is God and man. Okay, now Deuteronomy 6 verses 4 through 5 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. So notice he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. 
Now, the Jews calls, call this the Shema. I think I'm pronouncing it correctly. And uh, it's, you know, the Lord our God is one Lord. Now, um, this passage of Scripture emphasizes that there's only one God whose name is the Lord. That would be the Hebrew uh, Yahweh, right? Um, but it's interesting, and there's an intimation in the Shema about the Trinity. Because, first of all, God's name is mentioned three different times, okay, which in itself isn't conclusive, but it says there's one, uh, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. Okay, so God is mentioned three different times, but uh, the Lord, our God, the word God is Elohim. Now, the singular form is El, and the singular form, the name El was available to the writer, but he intentionally chose Elohim, which is plural. And when it says the Lord our God is one Lord, the interesting thing is that the, the word one there is the Hebrew word ichad, and it indicates one in a sense of a compound unity. Okay, so like in other words, like, uh, for example, a cluster of grapes. Okay, now cluster, that word is singular. But it uh, implies a plurality within that singularity. You know, you have a bunch of different grapes, but it's one cluster. And uh, and and uh, in Genesis two twenty four and Genesis eleven six, it says the two shall be one flesh, or the people is one. You know, they're the Tower of Babel. They got together and uh, the people is one. In other words, they were united. Okay, so the word ikad having the idea of compound unity. So when he says the Lord our God is one Lord, even though it's very strongly and staunchly monotheistic, still uh, it intimates clues about the Trinity. And uh, now the, the Trinity, that there's one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, is something we can partially apprehend with our minds, but we can never totally comprehend it. You know, I've been through this over the years. I've thought through it, and I've thought about it, and thought about it, and tried to really comprehend it completely. I, I can apprehend it with my mind, but, you know, I've, I've tried to figure it out, and then, you know, I thought, well, wait, maybe the whole thing is wrong. Maybe there is more than one God, or I, I don't know, how could that be? But then, then I go back to the scriptures, and the scriptures are very clear that there is one God, but the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Spirit is God, yet one God. So there are a lot of things in this world that we know work, but we don't fully understand how they work. I mean, how does a cell phone work? I mean, I know that you create a signal, and that signal goes to cell phone towers, and then it pings from the cell phone tower to another tower to somebody's phone. Oh, I know, but, but how does that work? I don't fully understand that. Very few people do, uh, but yet we know it works. So I don't have to understand completely and comprehend the Trinity, but it, you know, God's Word teaches it. So there's only one God, but the Father is God. The Son is God. The Spirit is God. But the Spirit is not the Father, and the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Father. You know, at the baptism of Jesus... He was baptized, and there was a voice from heaven, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And when Jesus was talking to the Father, the Father said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Jesus wasn't being a ventriloquist, making a voice from heaven. No, and the Father speaks to the Son, and the Father and the Son sent the Spirit. Uh, there, There is a distinction between the persons, but yet one God. Now, the three best illustrations, and there's no perfect illustration, but the three best illustrations of the Trinity I've come across, in my opinion, is first of all the mathematical illustration. One times one times one equals one. Or that, you know, water can be liquid or ice or steam. It's one substance, the same substance, but, you know, it takes on three different forms. Uh, and and uh, time is one singular 
essence, but there are three aspects of time that are distinct from one another, but yet they coexist together. I'm talking about past, present, and future. So time is one essence, but it's comprised of the past, the present, and the future. They coexist simultaneously. And, um, you know, right now, yesterday was tomorrow. Tomorrow, today will be yesterday. But so as you see, the past, present, and the future coexist together at the same time. So, so they're just illustrations of the Trinity. So if you don't completely comprehend it, welcome to the club. And, you know, we, we shouldn't be surprised at that. Because, uh, you know, there's a verse in Job that says, Canst thou by searching find out God? Can you find out the Almighty unto perfection? In other words, can we completely understand everything there is to know about God? And the answer is no. So the fact that he is one God who is triune in nature, and we can't completely put our heads around, our head, heads around that uh, and totally comprehend it, that shouldn't really surprise us. Now, the scriptures, let's look at a few passages of scripture that show us that the Holy Spirit is God, okay? Now, first of all, Jesus mentioned him uh, along with the Father in the, back, in the baptismal formula, okay? Matthew twenty eight nineteen, Jesus said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. And when you teach them the gospel and they get saved, then baptizing them in the name of, and he doesn't say names of, but in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now notice the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are mentioned together. Now, why is the, why is the Holy Ghost mentioned last? Well, there are exceptions to that. There are places in the New Testament where sometimes the Son is mentioned before the Father, but more often than not, the Holy Ghost is mentioned third. Why is that? Well, it, it, it seems like the Father is what initiates something, and then the Son continues it, and the Holy Spirit, like, finishes it off and brings it to completion. Okay, so, for example, the Father sent the Son so the Son, in order to carry out the Father's plan, died for our sins and rose again from the dead. But who is it that takes what the Father and the Son have done and applies it to the believer, opening our eyes to the truth and giving us a conviction of sin and giving us the desire to repent and to turn to Christ? Well, it's the Spirit of God. And then he's the one who dwells within us and sanctifies us, right? Sets us apart. And, you know, God, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. But it's Christ who says, it says in Hebrews, upholds all things by the word of his power. Okay, but yet the Spirit of God uh, continues the, the work of God and uh, it, it brings it to completion. The new creation is largely the work of the, uh, the Holy Spirit of God. Okay, now, so... And, and it's interesting, Jesus' baptismal formula, the implication is, hey, new believers, new Christians should be baptized in, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Uh, they should be taught this doctrine of the Trinity. The Trinity was, you know, there are intimations of it in the Old Testament, but really what made it more fully revealed was the Incarnation, right? Jesus who is God, the Son. He became flesh and dwelt among us, and, and the Holy Spirit is more clearly uh, explained and described in his ministry uh, since Christ went back to heaven and sent the Spirit is more fully pronounced in the New Testament. Okay, now, so what are some other evidences from the Scriptures that the Holy Spirit is himself? He is God. Well, he was involved in what God alone performed, and that's the creation. Now, notice in Isaiah 44, 24, it tells us very clearly that God created the universe. He did it by himself. He did it alone. In other words, nobody was there to help him. He did it alone by himself. Isaiah 44, 24, 
Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. Okay, so notice God says, hey, I, I stretch forth the heavens alone, I spread abroad the earth by myself. So did anybody help God create the heaven and the earth? The answer is no. He did it by himself. Therefore, if in, in the Bible creation is attributed to anyone, that very attribution proves that they are God. Okay, well, what does Genesis 1, 1 through 2 say? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. You see, here's creation, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So the Holy Spirit was involved in creation. Job 33, 4 says, The Spirit of God hath made me, and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. Job twenty six thirteen, By his Spirit... He hath garnished the heavens. Okay, so you see how uh, the scriptures tell us that the Holy Spirit was involved in creation. He is the creator, okay? So who created the universe? Was it the Father, or was it the Son, or was it the Spirit? The answer is yes. That's right. Okay, now, the same is true of Jesus, right? In John 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Okay, so every single thing in the universe that has ever been made was made by Jesus, made through him. So, um, no, the Holy Spirit is also omniscient. You know how God's omniscient? He knows everything. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 11 says, But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. You know, the things that God has prepared for those who love him. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now, do you hear what that's saying? Okay, no man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him. Nobody understands the way you think and feel the way you do, because you're you, right? You are the world's leading authority on what you're thinking and feeling, because no man knows the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him. Sometimes people may misjudge you, they might misunderstand you. They might falsely accuse you of having certain motives and, or you meant a certain thing when you said it, and it might not be true. You know better than anyone else because you're you. Okay, so what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now hear that. You know, you, you know more than anyone else what, what you're feeling and thinking because you're you. Well, by the same token, nobody knows the things of God uh, like the Spirit of God because he's God. That, that's, the, that's what this passage of Scripture is saying. So, the Holy Spirit is omniscient. He's also omnipresent. In other words, he's everywhere at once. Now, where do we find that in the Bible? Well, Psalm 139 says, Whither shall I go from thy presence, and whither shall I flee from thy spirit? Uh, if I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. So notice, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Right, so wherever the presence of God is, that's where his spirit is. The Holy Spirit is omnipresent. 
So he's omniscient, he's omnipresent, and he's also omnipotent because, you know, if he was there creating the heaven and the earth, what kind of power does it take to do that, right? But uh, the, the Holy Spirit, also he, he is also, in the New Testament, he is called the Lord. Now, where, where does the uh, New Testament call the Holy Spirit the Lord, okay? 2 Corinthians 3, 17 through 18. He says, now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, that's all believers there in Christ, all of us who are saved by faith, by grace through faith in Jesus, we all with an open face beholding as in a glass, that would be a looking glass or a mirror, uh, we're, we're beholding the glory of the Lord. He says, we're changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Okay, so it is the role of the Holy Spirit to work within us, you and I who are born-again believers in Christ, the people of God. It's the role of the Holy Spirit to work within us to um, transform us into the image of, of Christ in his image. So this this takes place by the Spirit of the Lord. He says, now the Lord is that Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There's true freedom uh, when the Spirit of God is in control and have his way, has his way. Okay, so there the Holy Spirit's called the Lord. So, so far we've seen he has the attributes of God. He's mentioned with the Father and the Son as being equal in Jesus' baptismal formula, but he, he's also omniscient and omnipresent, and uh, he's called the Lord in Second Corinthians chapter 3, but he's also referred to as God. In Acts 5, 3 through 4, Peter said to Ananias, Why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? He says, thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. In other words, when you lied to the Holy Ghost, you lied to God. Why? Well, because the Holy Ghost is God. Okay? Now, um, so the Holy Spirit, who is God, the Spirit, you know, you have the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. The Holy Spirit regenerated us. He made us alive. He accompanied the word of God and brought us to life. And he gives us the desire and the power to do the will of God. So he, he dwells within all believers in Christ. And he gives us the desire and the power to do the will of God. He also helps us understand the scriptures, right? Jesus said the comforter, he'll, he'll, when he, I'll send you the comforter, he will guide you into all truth. Now, let me read these passages of scripture to you that talk about how in the New Testament uh, God said I will dwell within you and walk among you and then the Holy Spirit fulfills that and uh, we we see his role of of sanctifying us and, and uh, okay Leviticus 26 1 he says uh, I am the Lord your God then in verses 11 through 12, and I will set my tabernacle among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. I will walk among you and will be your God, and ye shall be my people. Now, 2 Corinthians six, sixteen. So far, God says, I will walk among you. I'll be your God, right? So 2 Corinthians six sixteen quotes this. He says, And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Okay, so he says, We are the temple of the living God, because remember in Leviticus what we just read, I will dwell in them and walk in them, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. 1 Corinthians three sixteen and 17 says, 
Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Um, the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Okay, so we are the temple of God. God dwells within us. How? By his Holy Spirit. Now notice Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27. This is a, a description of the new covenant. He says, Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. That's the Holy Spirit. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. Okay, notice the sanctifying influence of the Spirit of God uh, living within us. Okay, so that's sort of a review and a primer, a reminder on who the Holy Spirit is. He's God, God the Father, God the Son, and then there's God the Spirit. Okay, now, back to our text, he says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Okay, don't grieve the Spirit. What does it mean to grieve the Spirit of God? Well, to grieve the Holy Spirit means to displease the Spirit, which causes him to feel sorrow. Now, you know, I, I don't believe that God is up in heaven and his degree of happiness depends on us. And he'll be happy if we just behave ourselves, but if we don't behave ourselves, then he's, he's, his day is ruined. And I, I don't think he's at the mercy of our what we do to manage his sense of happiness or whatever. But sometimes the Bible uses, um, I would call it an anthropomorphism. Like certain things that are true of humans, sometimes in a, uh, uh, they're, they're, they're applied to God in order to help us understand sort of how, how God feels about certain things. Now, God does have emotions. The Holy Spirit has feelings and emotions. The Holy Spirit is a person. Jesus referred to as he and him. And the Holy Spirit teaches and chooses and sets apart people for the ministry. The Holy Spirit inspires the Word of God. He's a person. And uh, you, you, you can't grieve an impersonal force, but you can grieve a person. So the Holy Spirit of God within us feels grieved. You see, there's one thing to be angry. Okay, but there's another thing to be grieved. Grief means you feel really bad about it. To cause pain or sorrow in someone's heart is to grieve them. And so the Spirit of God, rather than being pleased with the way we act and conduct ourselves, when we do certain things that are wrong and sinful or disobedient or selfish uh, uh, towards others, um, he, he feels a sense of sorrow and sadness, it grieves the Holy Spirit. So Paul says, don't grieve the Spirit of God. Now, here, here's an illustration of this. Genesis 6, verses 5 and 6. And God saw, this is the pre-flood world, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. And it grieved him at his heart. In other words, God felt sad when he looked at the human race and how they were acting, how, except for Noah and his family, every imagination of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. So, so when it says it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, that means he he, he felt the same way that you and I feel if we regret something. Now, God doesn't make any mistakes. So he knew what would happen. But he had a plan in allowing it to happen. But, but you know, as an anthropomorphic way of explaining it, uh, you know how you feel when you regret something? It's kind of how God felt when he looked at the way the human race was acting. So, so he saw this wickedness and it grieved him at his heart. 
while the Holy Spirit of God, who dwells within you and within me as believers in Jesus, uh, he feels grieved when we disregard him, when we disobey God, when we act uh, in ways that are dishonoring to God. Okay, so he says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Now, th this grieving the Spirit causes us to lose the joy of the Lord and the fullness of the Holy Spirit. By the way, I think it's possible to grieve the Holy Spirit in somebody else as well. Like if we say something that is wrong and sinful and evil, and through what we say we draw somebody else into sin or sinful ways of thinking or doing things, uh, you know, that's another way we can grieve the Holy Spirit of God within us or within someone else as well. Both are true. So um, w when we do this, if we grieve the Holy Spirit, what, what are we to do? Well, we need to repent and ask the Lord to forgive us when we grieve him. And then ask the Lord to take control of us and fill us anew with the Holy Spirit. You know, in Ephesians 5.18, it says, Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with the Spirit. Now, to be filled means to be dominated by or under the, the control of. You see, one word that could sort of summarize how God wants us to relate to him is a surrender. It's the idea, okay, God, I am done, I, I'm done fighting against you. I don't want to fight against you anymore or resist you. I want to go along with you and your will. In fact, I want your will to be done. So it's like Jesus said, not my will, but thine be done. That's that attitude of surrender. So sometimes we need to, to re-surrender our will to, to the Lord. Ask him to forgive us and to cleanse us and to uh, fill us again with his Holy Spirit. Now, he says, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Okay, so we know what that means. We don't want to do that, right? But he says, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So we're sealed by the Holy Spirit of God unto the day of redemption. Now, what does that mean? Well, a seal uh, in ancient times, uh, it, it referred to um, ownership and the preservation and to destination. Okay, suppose you had a manuscript, okay, and you had a message you wanted to send to somebody. So let's say that you were sending this to Octavius Josephus, okay? So you wrote the letter to Octavius Josephus, a Roman. Uh, well, if you wanted to make sure this letter got to him, and nobody messed with it, so it was preserved, and it was his, and it was preserved. He didn't want anyone to mess with it. He wanted to deliver it securely. You would put a seal on it, a seal either of uh, wet clay and let it dry, or of wax. So it's kind of like today we have envelopes, and you lick the envelope, and then the envelope sealed. That's so that nobody, hopefully unauthorized, breaks into the envelope and takes the mail out, right? Okay, so the Bible says we are sealed by the Holy Spirit unto the day of redemption. All right, so uh, now what that means then is that true believers, if we're sealed by the Holy Spirit of God unto the day of redemption, True believers can never be lost. Why? Well, first of all, because we're saved by grace through faith. And so if we could lose our salvation, presumably how would we lose it? By not being a good enough Christian? By not doing good enough? By uh, choosing to, uh, okay, we don't want to be saved anymore. Well, why? Well, so we can live a life of sin. So, so in other words, that, that, that would mean that our salvation would depend partly on our works, but it doesn't. It's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and to God alone be the glory. So, uh, you know, we're saved by grace through faith, not by our works. So once saved, always saved. But not only that, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, I know them. I give to them eternal life, and they shall never perish, 
Neither shall any man pluck them out of my Father's hand. We belong to Christ, and no one is able to pluck us out of the Father's hand. Uh, but, but another thing that shows us that once we're saved, we, a true believer can never be lost. He says we're sealed by the Holy Spirit of God unto the day of redemption. Now, Romans 8 says, Whom he justified, them he also glorified. So everybody who gets justified ends up getting glorified. Now what, you know, sometimes I hear uh, people say, well, what if somebody becomes a Christian and then they turn their back on all of it and they become an atheist? You mean they don't lose their salvation? Well, I say, no, they don't lose their salvation. They never had it in the first place. Because if they actually had true salvation, they would have never turned their back on the Christian faith and would have never become an atheist. But do you see, like it says in 1 John, I think it's verse two, chapter 2, verse 19, I think. But, but it, he says about antichrists. He says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. If they would have been of us, they would have no doubt continued with us. But they went out that it might be made manifest that they were not of us. Okay, so by their fruits you shall know them. If someone departs from the faith and they chuck the whole thing and they become an atheist, they didn't lose their salvation. They never had it to begin with. And their departure and their blatant apostasy is the evidence that they were never truly saved. True believers continue to believe and to persevere in the faith. Okay, so we are sealed by the Holy Spirit of God unto the day of redemption. What's that mean, unto the day of redemption? Well, the word redemption there sometimes means to release by pain or ransom, but other times it means to be delivered. Like the Bible says that God redeemed his people out of, his, uh, out of Egypt, right? In other words, he delivered them. Galatians 1 4 says about Jesus who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. See, deliverance from this present evil world, that's the day of redemption. When our redemption is fully realized in the form of deliverance from this world. Um, Luke 21 Verses 24 through 28 says this. Now this is when Jesus is talking about um, a, a large swath of time from his day to the day when he returns. He says, Luke 21, 24 through 28, And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. Okay, that's the Jewish people. That that happened in 70 AD. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Okay? So then, um, then, then when the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled, then Jerusalem will no longer be trodden down by the Gentiles. Okay? Now, pointing to the return of Christ, he says, and there shall be signs in the sun now see, he's talking to a Jewish, Jewish people. So, so what he's referring to then, he begins to refer to what Jews on the earth uh, during the Great Tribulation who are saved. Okay, there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity. They won't know what to do and they'll be distressed and the sea and the waves roaring, which probably is a picture of the human race in an uproar, men's hearts failing them for fear. Boy, we've seen a, uh, a touch of that with the COVID shenanigans, haven't we? And for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Okay, all kinds of disturbances, even in the cosmos, right? And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. So he says, when these things begin to come to pass, then look up, lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth 
nigh. In other words, your deliverance, your redemption draweth nigh. So we are, we're, we're told, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. You know, if you're not saved, the door to God's mercy and grace is open. Do you realize you're a sinner in need of God's forgiveness? Do you believe Jesus is God in the flesh, the Son of God, who died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins and rose again from the dead? Do you, do you believe he offers eternal life to those who will come to him? Are you sorry for your sins? Is there this desire in your heart that you want to be made right with God? Come to God in repentance. Say, God, I am sorry for my sins. I believe Jesus died for me and rose again from the dead. Please forgive me and save me on the basis of Christ's death and resurrection. Jesus, I take you as my Lord and my Savior. Come into my heart and life and change me. Make me the person you want me to be. Grant me the gift of eternal life. Uh, and, and if you are saved, have you been grieving the Spirit of God? Repent. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. May God's richest blessings rest upon you, both now and forevermore. Amen.